In New Zealand, there is a leader who knows a lot about China and the South Pacific and Australia too. He grew up poor only to become one of the nation's wealthiest businessmen. Then, at the peak of his financial fortune, he gave his business career away to give back to his country. For eight years, he was prime minister, popular, occasionally radical, but always level-headed. In turbulent times, his reasoned views are reason enough to watch this key interview. Hello, I'm Mark Llewellyn, your guest host on The Bigger Picture. Sir John Key, welcome to The Bigger Picture. Thanks very much, great to be here. What's the bigger picture then between China and the South Pacific? Oh, look, I think the bigger picture is that the situation or the relationship between China and the West is deteriorating at a very rapid uh, rate of knots. And the South Pacific's just a part of the way that that's playing out, really. I don't think it's new. I mean, I became Prime Minister in New Zealand in 2008. Yeah. When I became Prime Minister, China was still very active in the South Pacific. Uh, but it's that worsening general proposition between the West and, and China that's the big issue, really. Is it inevitable or can it be stopped, that deterioration? Uh, I think if you take a step back, when I became Prime Minister in 08 and Obama became President of the United States of America, same year, same time, the global perspective was that China would become more like us and all we needed to do was embrace them and they would feel more like us, they would be more like us. and. What happened was that that, that was the view for a, for a long period of time. And two things have happened. I think on the US side, there's Trump changed the global narrative. Did a remarkable job, actually. And those people wanted to believe that. And Trump's version of all of that was the simple way of defining whether the relationship is winning or losing for us is by the trade imbalance. Yep. And he doesn't believe that you, you can be win-win. And so... On the one hand, I think that was the situation with with on on the West side that they've completely changed this narrative, and now the argument is they're not like us. On the Chinese side, though, I think what has happened, actually, funnily enough, is they probably have had a really good look at the West, and they've said, said I don't want to be anything like you guys. So, so what just, was this? Yeah, is now this feels a little bit like that. I mean, I think. I think in the end, actually, where where I differ from lots of, and happy to talk about, but if you go to pretty much any any Australian leader, any you know past some you know kind of present um, right through, there, there, there's a general sort of view across most countries around the world that China's a sort of become militarily far more aggressive. What's and, your view? Well, the complete opposite, actually, right. and particularly around that they won't be. They're not. They're not necessarily force for even they certainly won't be militarily aggressive, which is a bit like when you first started the very first question around the South Pacific. Yeah. So the reason I don't think that is that we we in Australia and New Zealand have for a very long time had what we call one China policy. One country, many systems. We've recognised China's territorial authority but will they get up one day and say, I want to attack Australia or I want to attack a New Zealand? Not a chance. No history indicates that. It's not what they want to do. Just like the, US, the United States of America doesn't get up in the morning thinking, OK, I'm going to go and attack someone. What they do do is end up playing a role as an international policeman half the time and stepping into wars that, frankly, they don't even want to be in. But they don't actually go on a military offensive. And I don't think China are either. You're saying that? Not a chance? Not a chance. It's just not... Look, I'll tell you what I reckon... Because there are people in Australia, for instance, at the highest level of government and in the military who believe the opposite. I don't think they're going to go out there and be militarily aggressive. I, I, I realise that is the view of some Australian politicians and New Zealand politicians and others around the world, but this is what I think. They say we've got 400 million people that are in poverty. We've listed lots of people out of it. So I don't think they're sitting there thinking, how do I take on the world, the thing that you had and thinking, how do we make China the most powerful, you know, successful, wealthy country in the world? As Clinton used to say, it's the economy, stupid. Yeah, yeah, it's the economy, absolutely. That's what it's all about. And that's why Xi Jinping's popular at the moment, because actually he has lifted lots of people out of poverty. You know him? Yeah, very well. I you mean, like him? Yeah, I like him. Sir so John Key is a man who appreciates and recognises symbols of power. He's comfortable taking a seat at the top table. First as PM, 
and now as chair of ANZ New Zealand, the nation's biggest bank and largest company. But the chair, or chairs, he values most came out of a surprising friendship between Ki and Xi. So these are two chairs and a table yeah. that Xi Jinping bought out in the 747 when he came to New Zealand for a trip, flew them out. He was very proud of them, so he showed them to me up front. Cause a gift, a a gift for you. A gift for me. And the, the replica Ming chairs made out of uh, wood that apparently of itself is, is, is very, very old. Shows that you must have been good friends. Yeah, yeah. well, it's two of them, so you can come back for a drink. <laughs> <laughs> the two leaders met on multiple occasions, both in New Zealand and in China. So I went seven times when I was Prime Minister. Um, he came to New Zealand when he was Vice President and President. I like him. Look, he doesn't speak English. His wife does. Madame Deng, she speaks English very well. Like, I met Putin on a few occasions. He claims he doesn't speak English either. And I'd probably eat this armchair if, you know, if he doesn't. <laughs> we had some great nights. We had, a, we had a night together at Government House in New Zealand and he brought the Mao Tai along and we had lots of, you know, discussions, obviously, through translators. And, I mean, I think I've got a bit of a... I mean, I'm not saying I'm a world expert. I've just had time with him. But I reckon... I've got a sense of what he's trying to do. So why do they do that? Because we live in a multilateral world where sometimes you need votes and support. That's is it, is it, it a case though, just the, the way you're putting it, that, that that it's you either have to pick the US or China? Is there no in between here? That's where the world's going, I think. And yeah. that, that's a real problem for everyone. So you so, want an in between? Well, you do really because okay, if you take if you take Australia. It's clearly decided the answer to that question is the United States. And actually, Australia's been moving a bit away from New Zealand. And I, I, I totally understand. I, I, I get that. And I think, from our point of view, we have traditional allies, and they are clearly Australia, the United States, the United Kingdom, and Canada. We sound like them, we look like them, we feel like them, we culturally are them. Slightly different accents. <laughs> but we're about the same. Um, so... Look, ultimately, if we had to choose, I think you, can, you know, Blind Freddy can probably work out what side we would choose. But would we want to? I mean, wouldn't we want to be as a little trading nation at the bottom of the world, be able to have relationships with lots of different countries, access to lots of markets around the world? You know, you know what's interesting here, though? In the way of the world, what was once conventional wisdom is now seen as heresy. Yeah, I know. What was perceived as being common sense is yeah. now seen almost as you're a heretic. Yeah, yeah, no, do, no. Do you see that? Do you see yeah, that maybe yeah, yeah. your views have yeah. gone from being conventional to being on the outbuying? Yeah, but take, take Australia, for instance, though. I mean, Australia is a lucky country, you know? You can walk yeah. down the street and, you know, drop your car keys and, you know, oil or gas or, you know, Copper or iron ore or something come out of the hole you just lend from the ground. You know, it's an interesting yeah. Kiwi perspective. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, that's a lucky country. Well, maybe you've got to be in Western Australia to do that. But anyway, you're still there. I mean, the point being, okay, look at BHP, Rio, you know, fantastic Aussie companies, yeah. you know, you're massive exporters. I mean, I'd sort of ask the question, well, what would happen if they had no access to China? What would happen? Well, significantly reduce their earnings and, and Australia's, Australia wouldn't be nearly as wealthy a country. So I've always argued from a New Zealand point of view, our relationship with China starts actually in a different place to our traditional allies. So if you went to almost any Kiwi and said, tell me who you want to have a barbecue with, an Australian or someone from China? Almost everyone's going to say in Australia. Why? Because you like us. You sound like us, you look like us, you follow sports, you drink beer, you yeah. know, you're all those things. We're all the same, right? Whereas culturally, we're actually quite different from people in China. So our relationship with China starts from a mercantile basis. You know, they're just our biggest trading partner. You know, by the way, the, I think Australia's biggest trading partner, if not one of. Yeah. Um, and so I kind of look at it and I say, well, okay, then, then, then does that mean it just solely starts and stops on selling things? And the answer is no. And, and it can be everything from the, their approach to climate change to regional security. Um, y you know, you are much more likely to have a better relationship with them if you're on talking terms with them. And by the way, Australia's a wealthy country because of it. So, I don't know, I, that, that's the view I've taken. But Australia's taken a very different view and it's been a more aggressive view and, I mean, some people would argue, well, BHP is still selling things to them, but I would sort of argue with you that um, I would... Uh, if, well, if I was Prime Minister of Australia, I would have a more uh, reasoned line that I would run and, um, and it wouldn't be naive, 
well, some people would say I am very naive, but I, I, I just don't know that yelling at them is getting you far. So the question always becomes with all of these things, what's the fastest way to, you know, to have change and to be involved in change and to, to, to make that possible? And, 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 and is it when you just yell at people all the time? Because, by the way, when, when a husband and wife yell at each other the whole time, it's called divorce, yeah. right? Actually, they don't resolve the issues, they just end the relationship, right? And I think it's like that with us. I mean, you can have very strong rhetoric and you can yell and scream and you can call each other names, but do you reckon they listen to you when you do that? I reckon you better have, try and work on having a better relationship and evoke change by being someone that they might listen to. Well, sounds almost obliquely that you're referencing what happened with Australia under the Morrison government. Yeah, well, that, look, I mean, it's not just Morrison either. I mean, I think it, it, Australia has taken a much stronger line on China for a long period of not time. Not something you agree with? Well, I just don't know what you get out of it. I mean, I, I kind of, you know, I mean, do you want me to be a real cynic? I mean, okay, Australia, you know, had very strong rhetoric and ended up with a beef and barley and, you know, lobster ban, and, and which is great if you want to buy a lobster, you know, at Woolworths, but, you know, not so good if you're the person producing them because you can't sell them for a premium anymore. Yeah. But then who, who went and filled the void of all that? America. The very people that, by the <laughs> way, you're being the sheriff of the South for, they went and sold more beef to. China. So tell me what you got out of it. Did you tell Scott Morrison at the time? Did you speak to him and say to him? No, no, no. I mean, what would you have said to him? Well, the Australians, it's, it's not, as I said, it's not solely with Scott because the Australians, as the Americans did, would say to me from time to time, hey, we think you need to beef up the rhetoric they have. And we would say, look, we do make these comments and we do talk to them, but we just do it in a way which is a bit more respectful starting point and, and we, we would take up things we don't do it at you know, 100 decibels and in public, we do it more in private. And that's what you see, what conversation, talk, behind the scenes, no rhetoric, no loud hailer is probably a better way of resolving issues. Well, put it this way, ask yourself this question. Okay, let's imagine we're just frozen in a time capsule today and we wake up in 20 years' time. You tell me, is China bigger or smaller than it is today? I reckon now it's bigger. Is China more influential or less influential? I think more influential. Is China's superpower, yes or no? Yes. I mean, the point is, all this stuff is naturally going to happen because it's just sheer momentum, notwithstanding all the challenges in their economy at the moment, which are vast, and their ageing population. They're just big and they're going to get bigger. And their sphere of influence in, the, in, in Asia and, and, and in the world is going to become greater. So my point is, we either have to say we learn to work alongside people all we have to say we we're permanently in this position where we're just opposed. Would you consider taking on a mediating role in this region? Uh, yeah. Um, How would you play that if you well, did? Well, I mean, the, 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 the first thing is you have to build up some level of relationship. So it strikes me, and I might be wrong, but I think I'm right, that being in the US recently, there always used to be, forget about what you see on TV and you see, you know, the president of a country and the prime minister or whatever, you know, and they're, and they're either shaking hands or it's not going so well or whatever, you know, that's, that's one thing that you see. But at every layer beneath that, there's always been relationships. So the United States has had many sort of backdoors and positions that can, it's able to communicate messages with lots of countries, yep. China being one of them. And Australia's had the same. I think the, relationship is broken down to a level where those relationships are far more tenuous and not at all deep. And 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 so each side doesn't understand each other very well now. Right, becomes um, more polarised. Oh, I think there's, yeah, I think they'll be more polarised. I think they've become more sceptical. I think it's just, I think the whole thing has become more fractured. Well, you, and it's you, on both sides. You created clearly a good relationship with President Xi yeah. to the point that you became friends. Yeah. You know, friendship in diplomacy is an unusual thing. Yeah. Why did that happen? Exposure, I think, and trust. I mean... So you, you, you look back at, uh, at your relationship and you look yeah. forward to what's happening now. Is it with despair or do you still have some optimism that, that things can change? Oh, a tiny, uh, tiny amount of it's despair. Well, well, give me your best case scenario. Oh, look, I think the best case scenario is the temperature eventually comes out of things a wee bit. And what ends up happening is both sides say, okay, well, we have to cohabitate in a world which, you know, we, we want to be, you know, peaceful and better and successful and more coordinated on global multilateral, you know, issues. And we start getting back to a point where we, we're trying to identify the things we can agree on 
hopefully there's some of those, and we do a bit better job on working on things that we can't agree on. All I try and do is say, here's another perspective. I'm just saying, everywhere, in everything in the world, you see some things that aren't great. But may maybe, maybe, maybe there was some naivety in 08. Maybe there was. But is everything as bad as what they say in 2022? I mean, like, surely to goodness, I mean, I just don't think that the Trump version of things is right. And I think that because you have a trade imbalance doesn't mean that you lose and they win. Um, we have a trade imbalance with lots of countries and we have a trade surplus with lots of countries. We're not winning because we have a trade surplus with China. We just happen to have a bigger consumer market for what we produce. So, OK, we can go and try and say we'll chuck, cut China out of the supply chain, but maybe another argument is to say, can we just have a slightly better relationship on both sides and actually accept, actually, there's just some things they do really well. And they're going to be a massive consumer because they are nowhere near, I mean, notwithstanding their ageing population, nowhere near finished getting you know, much wealthier on both a per capita basis and nominal basis. Seems like you need to ride in on the white horse and knock some heads together. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's my wife says to me sometimes, there's nothing so former as a former Prime Minister. <laughs> <laughs>
I, I reckon, a really confident country. Now, I, I know some people say, well, that's not always true, but I mean, it's the way you want to win at sport and it's the way you want to, you just want to win, I think. And I think New Zealand's this fantastically blessed country. Yeah, it's smaller and it's kind of like the size of a state of Australia, but the reality is I wanted New Zealand to be this more internationally connected, more globally confident, confident and assertive. It's why I wanted to change the flag. I didn't really give a monkeys about the flag, but our current flag means nothing and a flag with a silver fern on it means New Zealand. Yes. And that was really what it was all about it was about about evolving the country and so yeah by the time I got to the point I could do it and could afford to do it because I was in a luxurious position to be pretty well off by that so yes I can make that choice that I wasn't going to earn any money for you know 15 years or so um I decided I, I didn't want to die wondering and I wanted to do it and I never will die wondering and I'm really glad I did it it's a great position to be in. I mean you wanted yeah. to take the country to the point where you could say once we're warriors yeah you know? yeah so, yeah, yeah. People will say to me, you know, tell me one piece of wisdom or something, I don't know, whatever. And I just guess, look, you know, my mother used to say, you get out of life what you put into it. And I, you can have a million excuses of why something's wrong, why yeah. someone's wronged you, why, you know, I don't know, why, you know, your luck's run out. But eventually, eventually, you kind of create your own luck. And I think in places like Australia and New Zealand, if you really want to be successful, you will be. Because the opportunities are there. They really are. For most people, it's very, very few people that couldn't really get there if they if they want to. It doesn't mean it's going to be easy, and it doesn't mean it's everyone's going to be, you know, Gina Reinhart wealthy. Yeah. But it, but it does mean that you can have a real opportunity. I think. Well, John Keane, thank you very much. Thanks very much.